Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? We're kind of moving in, right? Getting ready. I feel I got I got wires hanging on me all over the place. I feel like I'm like so if I if I sound like I'm wired, it's because I am wired. So, hey, it is good to see all of you uh, this morning. Let me invite you to come on in and have a seat. Uh, I want to share just a few quick announcements with you before we join uh, our praise team. For those that don't know. Uh, I'm doing a quick scan. I think everybody does know who I am. I know I was gone last week, but uh, I'm Tim. I happen to be the the pastor here, and uh, it's a joy and a privilege uh, to serve uh, this church and uh, to be with you uh, engaged in our community. Last week, I was uh, up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, and I was there as part of the uh, leadership initiative up there. Uh, I also was there for cold weather training. Uh, It was I went running in the morning and it was 28 degrees outside. That was, uh, and, I, and I, I had a beanie on my head and gloves on my hands, uh, but was in a pair of shorts while doing that because it just didn't make sense to buy, you know, pants that you might wear in cold weather running uh, in uh, North Carolina. So I only did that like three times because I was like, this is crazy. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, when I uh, went up there, uh, I wasn't sure that, that this week, that week I was there, was going to be for me uh, because the whole week was talking about conflict and change. And I'm like, oh, I don't have conflict and I'm not dealing with any change in our church. That is a spiritual gift of mine, sarcasm. <laughs> and uh, so here, here's, a, here's a, I knew this definition before I got up there, but a definition for you to to think about. It's written by a guy named Ron Hyafitz, and he says, leadership is disappointing people at a rate they can experience and accept. You got that? Yeah. So conflict will always occur because I'm trying to figure out what rate can you handle me disappointing you uh, in that process, right? Uh, I also read a book uh, before going, which is a great book. I'll probably have our leadership team read. It's called Switch. And uh, it's about elephants and riders, and, and I'm not going to go into it, but, but here was the point. To, to bring about change, someone's got to act differently. Anybody volunteering to act differently? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so as I read that, I'm like, ooh, that might be about me. I might need to act a little bit differently. But both those things, if we think about them, have to deal with loss, right? Conflict uh, and uh, change, they're all... They're all about how we respond with loss. And the reason I'm going a little bit longer in this today uh, is I'm going to be starting uh, today a sermon series on on loving people who bring about conflict uh, and who bring about change uh, in our lives. So it's not about me, uh, but it'll be something for us to think about. So, hey, when you came in this morning, uh, I need you to do me a quick favor. You should have gotten a strip of piece of paper. I don't want you to write anything on there but a number. And here is the number I want you to write down. How old will you be 10 years from now? So I was thinking about this when I was driving back and, and I was just, uh, I, I was thinking uh, about, you know, where would this, where would I hope this church might be 10 years from now? And uh, so what I'm going to do during a football game is, is add up these numbers and, and uh, oh, by the way, you guys would love a, a podcast I just listened to about Mahomes. Uh, yeah. And, uh. I thought I was going to go a little bit longer before I made any comment about the football game today, but uh, didn't get far. But all I want you to do is just write down a number. Now, if you have kids that will still be living in your home 10 years from now, like I'm hoping mine aren't, right? I would like for you to write down their age 10 years from now. So if they're 6, then you're going to write down 16, right? Uh, if they're 16, you don't need to write down 26 because you're probably like me, hoping that they have moved on. Okay, Uh, so if you'll do that, and then uh, if you will, uh, when it comes time for the offering, if you'll just come and place it up here on in the plate, uh, that will be helpful. It will drive the ushers nuts, but it'll be great for me. I will collect them at the end of the service, uh, and uh, like I said, during the football game, it'll give me something to do to to, uh, as I watch the game. So, enough of that, right? Uh, Speaking of the game, if you brought your cans of soup in or you brought in loose change, uh, after this service, if you'll go over to the gathering place, uh, I was excited to go in and see the display. If you haven't seen that, 
Uh, by the way, uh, 49ers look like they're, you know, they have that two-point advantage. <clears throat> I was expecting that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I was actually kind of surprised that, that I was like, wow. The 49ers, there's a conspiracy going on here, but that's another story. So uh, let me encourage, if you've brought your cans, to, to do that over there. And remember, uh, it's really not, I mean, uh, for some folks it really is about the Kansas City Chiefs, but for the rest of us, uh, it's really about cross ministries and the impact it will have on that. Uh, also, uh, I've had the chance to see the order of worship for our Ash Wednesday service that the youth and children are going to be putting on. Uh, it's going to be a great service, so I hope you're making plans to come. Uh, guess when it's going to be? Ash Wednesday, Ash Wednesday right. That's on Valentine's Day. So it's coming this Wednesday uh, at 6.30. It'll be here in the chapel. So we hope that you'll come and be a part of that. And then uh, for those that have been in this community for a long uh, time, uh, you know that uh, Charles Perry has passed away. Uh, and we will have his uh, funeral service uh, today at 2 o'clock over in the gathering place. And so we invite you to come back and uh, be a part uh, of that uh, service later this afternoon. So uh, let's stand and, and give God our, our, our joy, our thanksgiving, and our happiness this morning as we uh, join our praise team in worship.
Ashley, I love when you, when you help us with signs. I don't know if you guys notice this, but when she does glorious, you know what she does, right? That she goes all around, right? Glorious. God's glory shines all around. How does that happen? Well, one, it's with people like Ashley that helps us see, right? But uh, if you notice, if you look at the, the praise team, if you look at Ashley and you see what the smile on their face, right? People ask, why are you smiling today? You know, Nick was giving me a hard time about my sarcasm earlier. Well, I can tell you, sarcastic people are hard to get to smile, right? And I think sometimes we can be overwhelmed by all that's going on in the world that we forget about God's glorious name, right? And as we just sang, blessed be the name. There's a, there's a line in there where it talks about even in the, in the dark times, right? I will, I'm blessed by his name. You know, Yeshua, God saves, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, will you spend this moment with me in prayer? It is good, Lord, for us just to pause for a moment and be mindful of your presence in this place. And we are so grateful that you were already here before we ever arrived. You've already sat in these seats and you have, you have asked us to come with hearts that would be willing to be touched by you. And Lord, we have come. We've come from all different directions. We've come with all kinds of things that have gone on in our lives this past week. And in, in a spirit of worship and a spirit of openness, your Holy Spirit has come and said, you are my people. Hear, hear me now. And so, Lord, we bring to you all of the hurts and the pains that we have experienced this past week, all of the, the ways in which we have been disappointed, the ways in which hope that we once had was deferred and, and we're still waiting for answers to come. We thank you that you are God with us, that you are the God who promises that while it may seem dark right now, I am the light and the darkness cannot overcome the light. We thank you for the blessings that we've had this past week, the, the ways in which you uh, helped us have wonderful experiences in our lives, the, the people we've been allowed to laugh with and do life with and love with. We give you thanks for that, and that, Lord, is why we've come to worship this morning, to celebrate that we are your blessed sons and daughters, and we have received countless blessings from you. And Lord, we are so mindful of people in our community that are without homes, people in our community that are wondering where their next meal will come from, people in our communities that are struggling, trying to, to learn and, 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 and to stay up with the rest of their classmates. We are mindful of parents that are struggling to, to hold down a job and be fully present with, for their children. We're mindful of people in our community that are struggling with addiction and depression and loneliness. And less, yes, Lord, we are mindful of things that are glowing, going on in our global world. We continue to ask for peace in the Middle East. We ask, Lord, that there would be a bridge between Israel and Palestine. We pray for peace to be in the Ukraine. And Lord, we know there are, there are battles and there are fights that are happening all over the world that we are, we are oftentimes like sitting on a powder keg just waiting for an explosion. And your word teaches us and tells us, blessed are the peacekeepers. Lord, help us to understand how to, to, to be those peacekeepers in times of unrest, in times of uncertainty, in, in times that create great anxiety and worry within us. Help us to be people of love, people of compassion, people of empathy, people whose desire it is to walk close with you. And so, Lord, we thank you again for, for being in this place and, and for promising that if we come... If we come with an openness, if we allow your spirit to move in our, in our thoughts and in our emotions, 
we would experience your presence. For you are a God who does not force your will upon us. You are a God who invites us to be in your presence, to experience your love and your joy and your peace. You're a God who has promised that even if we came this morning and we sat as stubborn rocks, you would still love us. You would still have compassion for us. So may our hearts be inspired by your presence. And Lord, as we offer ourselves to each other and as we offer our gifts to this community, may you truly place your hands upon us and allow us to be that living sacrifice. Allow us to be a gift to each other and a gift to our community the way we have received you as a gift. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, let me invite you to stand and be a gift to one another. Greet one another. Uh, If you've got that little strip of paper with a number on it, please come and and put that in the offering plate. If you've got uh, another strip of paper with lots of numbers on it, you know, with a dollar sign in front, you can bring that to the front as well. So come and greet one another. Let me, uh, let me invite you back. So Jackie, were you, were you saying to me just offline? Hold on a second. If you guys would like to get home in time for the Super Bowl. Oh, well. <laughs> Let's start on... Uh, <laughs> so. so Jackie, were you and I just talking offline about the title of the sermon, or did someone else mention there was some concern about this ideal of a relational vampire? Was it just you and me talking? You said the choir, the choir, the choir was making, making jokes about it. So you may notice in the bulletin, you know, it has a, it has a different sermon title and a different scripture. Some of you uh, may be actually sharp and say, didn't you already preach that sermon? And uh, I did. That's not... Um, that's, uh, unfortunately, Brenda got the wrong, the wrong sermon title in there uh, for, for this service, but we're good to go. So it is, the title is The Critical Relational Vampire, uh, and, and I'll, hopefully we'll explain what that means as we, we go along in this 
uh, the sermon uh, series. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm starting a new series today, but the, the truth is this series uh, actually belongs in a, a much bigger series. I've decided uh, throughout um, this year, I don't know if you guys have noticed that we as a, as a nation have gotten a little bit more polarized, uh, divisive. Uh, I, I, you know, um, and sometimes when you have things that go on, I talked about conflict early on, so, so our denomination will have its general conference in May, uh, and so that will, that will probably create some, some, uh, some energy around that. And hey, in case you didn't know, uh, just so that you, get, you can be prepared, we have a national election this year. Did you guys know that? And it's going to be the most peaceful, loving compassionate I mean it's going to show us what what Jesus meant by love one another do you agree do I uh, I do too yeah uh, um, did I mention my name is Tim and I have the gift of sarcasm yeah so to, to be on I so so throughout this year uh, I'm going to be doing a variety of different sermon series to address that idea. Um, and because uh, I want us to, to learn how to love people uh, who very much could steal and suck the very joy, the very peace, the very inspiration out of our lives. You ever been around folks like that? And that's, so that's kind of what, uh, that's really, so that while I'm starting a new series today, uh, throughout, throughout the year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back and forth to that. So today, though, we're going to start with how, does, how to love critical people. Um, but before we do, let's, uh, let's pause uh, for a moment and invite God to, to guide us in this conversation. Will you pray with me again? So, Father, once again, we, we call upon your name. You know, as we've been, blessed be your name. And as we hear this message this morning, may you be elevated and may your Holy Spirit truly uh, be the interpreter and the translator of these words because it is our heart's desire to be more like you in a very difficult and very challenging world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we're going to talk about uh, critical people, but it's quite possible that uh, some of you may not know a critical person in your life. Huh. I I, I guess that's not true or else you're like, I'm looking straight at you. Of course I know a critical person. It it may be possible that you're sitting next to the critical person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would not invite you to go there right now uh, and say that. Uh, But uh, it's also possible that you are that person. Just a thought. Um, So let's get on the same sheet. Let me help kind of define what I mean this morning by a critical relational vampire, right? Uh, A critical relational vampire is someone who has the spiritual gift of fault finding, right? Has a spiritual gift of cynicism or harsh negative criticism and after you have been engaged with that person right you've been around that person it feels like the very life and energy has been drained right out of you or sucked right out of you we're all on the same sheet now right so we know what we mean when i when i'm talking about this idea of a critical relational vampire um so an example in the bible of uh, of this kind of person would be Eliab. Anybody remember who Eliab was? So Eliab was the oldest son, uh, Jesse's oldest son, when Samuel was going to look for the next king of Israel, right? And he lines up all of his, all of his sons, and David is missing. Eliab is the oldest. So one day, Jesse sends, says to David, this is when the army is out doing battle. Uh, in fact, this is, leads into the story of David and Goliath. Uh, he sends his son to, to go and get news, hear what's going on, and take the food to the soldiers. 
And so David does what his dad tells him to do. He loads up the cart and he's taking the food and he's having this conversation with the soldiers. And as he's having this conversation with the soldiers, his brother Eliab comes along, right? And his brother begins to, to light into him. You know, he begins to call him names and he says that you're being lazy and that you're shirking your responsibilities and, and the only reason that you're out here is because you're conceited and you're full of yourself. And the next sentence that we read uh, is David saying these words, now what have I done? I can't even speak right. You ever been around somebody that is like, there's not a single thing I could absolutely do right. This is how David is feeling in that moment. You can feel the energy just kind of coming out of him. Uh, another example of, of, uh, of this person would be uh, another older brother. <laughs> All right, and in this case, this is the older brother in the story of the prodigal son, right? You'll remember that he was, he was critical of the father's forgiveness uh, and, and the father's mercy. And so what did he do? He refused to, to go to the celebration, right? They were, they were having this big party because the younger son had, had come home and, and, and dad was all full of excitement and joy because this son that once was lost had now been found. The son that he thought was dead was now alive. Now I ask you, if you were dad, or you were the younger, the younger son, and you knew that the older son was having a party in his mind about how ungrateful dad was, do you think there would be a lot of energy at that party? All right. Now, these two biblical examples are of older siblings. My intention is not to say if you're the firstborn that you're naturally wired and gifted uh, to, be, uh, to have that spiritual gift of fault finding. And, and while many fault finders are indeed older siblings, uh, most people who develop the spiritual gift do so because they have a, they have a, um, a high sense of what is fair, what's right, in what's just, right? They, they, have this, they have this sense of what, what should be in order uh, kinds of things. Like for some of us, we, we may not be this fault-finding person, but we may discover that when we get in our automobiles and we start driving, that we become very critical of all the other drivers. Why is that? Because we know there's a right way to drive on the, in the, on the highway. It is not in the middle of my lane. Right? And so just so, so we understand this, uh, that, that they tend to be people who are hardworking, they're highly detailed, they're organized, they're responsible, they're self-disciplined, they're always seeking ways to improve themselves, and they're wanting to help you improve. Right? They tend to believe that the things are not worth doing if they're not done right. Do you know any people like that? Right? Yeah. So another example of, of this critical person would be the religious leaders of Jesus' time. These leaders oftentimes get a bad rap, don't they? Right? Uh, because they certainly had a very critical spirit about them. But the reason they were critical of Jesus is because he was constantly messing with what their system of justice and rightness was. Right? Right? I mean, think about it. He, there's a story where there's this woman caught in adultery. And I'm not talking about, well, what about the man, I, right? But, but what does Jesus say? Hey, you without the first sin, go. He doesn't hold. And, and these disciples, right, they go out and they're, they're plucking grain on the Sabbath. How many times did, he, did they break the Sabbath laws? And then they, you know, the, Jesus challenged and questioned their authority. Jesus eats and he drinks with what? Gentiles and and riffraff. So can we honestly blame them for wanting to protect their traditions, their institutions? Anybody relate to wondering what's happening to our traditions and our institutions these days? Right? So we can understand they, they love and they cherish these things. So, and so the critical relational vampire faces a major challenge Dolly Parton says it this way, that they, the, the, the critical relation vampire person, they, they want to be a diamond in a rhinestone world. Not only that, they want you to be a diamond in a rhinestone world. That's why they're so critical of you. They just want to improve you so that you 
will be a diamond. They, they just want to, everything to be perfect and right so that they can be diamonds. It's just that their words feel more like sandpaper, right, than they do a polishing cloth. True? Yeah. Now, the truth is that may all be a well and good, but let's be honest. If you're on the pointy end, it may be good to know, okay, they really, they just want me to improve. They just want me to be a diamond. But the truth is, if you're on the pointy end of their criticism, how many of us want to say, oh, could I have another? Could you just give me one more? Right? I mean, you know, we all remember the, the little nursery rhyme that we learned on the playground at school, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but we're... Isn't that the biggest load of yogurt you ever heard? Right? But we teach it to our kids today. Say, oh, don't worry, honey. It's just words. That ain't true. It hurts. Right? <laughs> I mean, we... Negative criticism, even if it somehow is supposed to improve, it still hurts, and it ain't a whole lot of fun, right? Okay, and guess what? Doing the Christian thing, you know, responding to the critical person, it ain't a whole lot of fun either. Uh, I, I basically, uh, Jerry and I, you and I were talking about this earlier on, I, I basically have two gears uh, that I operate in when I'm having to, to deal with a, with a critical uh, person, right? And I don't know if you know this or not, but as a pastor, you get to do that pretty regularly, right? I, don't, I, I mean, there's times I say to God, is this, is this my penance? <laughs> you know, this is, but, but, so I have two gears. My first gear is I compete. Like, I, I, will, I will defend like there ain't no tomorrow. That's my first gear, <laughs> My second gear is to avoid. It is to run away from that critical person like I am being chased by a mama grizzly bear that is juiced up on cocaine. I mean, I'm going to go lickety split and get as fast out of Dodge as I can. So I want to say let's discover uh, a better way for loving that critical relational vampire because while it is not fun, it is the pathway of a disciple of Jesus. And that's what we're called to be, right? Uh, now, the good news is there's only two steps. The bad news is those are really hard steps. So step number one, uh, express empathy. Express empathy. Empathy allows us to see beyond the behavior of the person that with a critical spirit. Now, when you choose, when you choose to call on the power of empathy you are actually trying to see the cause of their pain and struggle, right? You're seeking to understand the story behind the emotions, right? Behind the words, behind the actions. You're, you're not trying to explain anything. You're not trying to correct anything. You're just trying to listen to what's behind the words, the actions, the, the emotions. Now, I, I believe that behind every frustration, uh, every word spoken in anger, every harsh criticism is a person asking for compassion. Uh, and they're asking for understanding. Here's an example in the Bible. Job is weeping bitterly. If we remember the story of Job, I mean, he loses his uh, loses his family, he loses his household, he loses his business, he loses everything. He's laying out his criticism before God. He's, he's become very critical towards God. He's wounded, he's hurt, and he's lashing out. Can we relate? Right? You ever been, right? He does everything he can to express his disappointment with God. Yet even in the pain, he refuses to deny God. Even, even with all that's going on, even that everything that he is expressing, he will not, he refuses to, denou to denounce God. Even his wife says to them, says, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just say, I am done with you, right? Now imagine the depth of friendship and love that would have resulted if Job's friends, remember he has these three buddies that come along, 
if they had embraced the power of empathy instead of criticizing him because of his critical spirit. Right? Imagine if they had chosen to let him rant and rave for however long it took instead of offering unsolicited advice or judging his character. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When embracing the power of empathy, you don't have to say anything to someone who's lashing out at you with a harsh, critical spirit. Sometimes you just need to wait and listen. Remember what I said, two, two steps, but neither of them are easy. I want to be honest with you. Embracing the power of empathy is an aspirational desire for me. An aspirational desire that, that, that means that it's not fully present within me. It means that I'm more likely to defend than to listen. But I long for the day that I will listen more than I defend. I, I want to be more patient and generous with that critical relational vampire in my life. It's aspirational because I'm not consistent in that process. Jesus, just so in case you ever got confused, I'm not Jesus. Okay? Jesus, however, always, always displays the power of empathy. Expressing empathy was an actual desire in his life. It was not an aspirational desire. In, in the text that you have uh, in the bulletins that were for today, or 1 Peter 2, 23, Jesus tells us that when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. This is why, you know, aspirational, actual, I'd say, oh, that's great. A aspirational, I'd say, that stinks, right? When he suffered... He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I'm a Christ follower. I, I've been a Christ follower for, I don't know, 30 years now. I, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Therefore, my goal, my ambition is to be like Jesus that means that in this lifetime, while I'm still kicking and breathing, expressing empathy needs to, be, needs to move from being aspirational to being actual. So if I'm like, what's my purpose? Why am I here on earth? This is one of those things. It is learning how to have empathy. Right? I'm not there. But I could be. And so can you. How? <laughs> well, let's be honest, right? We have to be honest with each other and honest with ourselves. We need to ask this question, do I really want to be in a place where I'm willing to be encountered by a person who has a critical spirit? Do I really want to be in that environment, that surrounding, right? Let me, let me say it to you this way. Do you know how you get good at handling conflict? Yeah, that's what he says, right? We all, we all joke around if you're in Walmart or you're stuck in traffic, right? You say, someone out here prayed for patience and God said, let it be, right? So guess what? <laughs> if you want to be good, if you want to get good, get more like Jesus by intentionally being where critical relational vampires hang out, well, then guess what? You got to hang out with them. Ain't that a bummer? I mean, you really, we have to, our, our life verse, our, our, our prayer each day is, oh Lord, please, please, I want to I be more like you. Will you please put more critical people in my life today? I don't know about you, but I'm like, Lord, I'm not ready for that. Can I have that gentle shepherd person, right? So number two, imitate Jesus. Sounds a whole lot like the first one. Imitate Jesus. Jesus actually teaches us in his first sermon how to deal with critical relational vampires. 
He says this, happy are you. And, and if you look in the Amplified, it says envied. Is anybody envious of you? <laughs> but Jesus says, happy are you, envied are you when people insult you, ridicule you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Woohoo! Now, Jesus gives a context. He says, listen, the, the idea is that when, when you're living and in, 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 uh, imitating my lifestyle, this is what people will do. And you should be happy that people are doing that because you're, they're identifying you as a Jesus follower, as a disciple of mine. But what about when people, you know, are critical of the, the way you cook? Or clean house? Or the way you shop? I mean... Jackie and I, at one time, we were so in love with each other, we went and bought groceries together. I don't think we bought groceries together for at least 30 years. Because she doesn't buy groceries the way I want her to buy groceries. Right? Uh, or the way you wear clothes. Or the way you drive. Do you have any backseat drivers? Again, Jackie would have comments about this, right? Right? Or movies that you watch, or books that you read, or if ever someone actually criticizes the, the candy that you eat. Right? Does, do I have to respond? You know, should I be happy and envious? Do I have to? I mean, that's not the kind. That, that's not, no one's talking about the way Jesus lived and those, those examples. Don't I get to respond differently? Do, you understand what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, I found the loophole. Right? When people criticize me, that. This is what my question would be. So uh, if we want to be smart and we want to imitate Jesus, then we need to what? We need to ask Jesus. So Jesus, these people don't fall in that category over here. They're in a whole different category. How should I respond? This is what my, if, if, you, know, if you were looking at my journal, my prayer journal, it would say this. Jesus, what the heck am I supposed to do with that person who's constantly nitpicking at me? Who even criticizes the way I breathe? I can't stand it anymore. If that person says one more critical thing to me, I'm going to go ape on them. So tell me, what am I supposed to do with this nut job? Now, you're probably much more polite. Jesus' response. Dude, I picture Jesus, you know, in flip-flops and hanging out at the beach, right? And maybe for you, it might be dudette. But this is Jesus' response. I get it. I know it's hard. I remember being in the garden knowing what was about to come. I knew I could call on a legion of angels to come to my defense. I know I, I could compel people to see that I was the Messiah by displaying the full might of heaven. I was totally tempted to give in. So I cried out, not my will, but your will be done. So yes, I, I, I get the frustration. I, I understand the pain. But I drank the cup and I said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. You know, even if they knew what they were doing, even if they were choosing to intentionally harm me, I was still going to choose to love them. I was still going to choose to seek out ways to bless them. So here's my answer to you. Love your enemies. Do good to those who mistreat you. Forgive them 70 Time seven. Continuously search for them as if you're looking for, for lost keys or a lost car or a lost child. Trust me, I know this is a hard teaching. Even I was tempted. But remember, you are not doing this by yourself. You're not doing this by your own power, not by your own strength, not by your own determination. You can't. The only way you're going to love this person who has the spiritual gift of making your life a living hell is by imitating me. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is by receiving the gift that I gave to you. 
the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand now why I say loving critical people, loving difficult people is an aspirational desire for me? Because it's hard. It's because loving critical people is hard and it hurts. You know why it hurts? Because there's probably some truth in what they're saying. There's probably truth in what they're pointing out. But when I'm situational, when I'm arbitrary about loving critical people, it creates opportunities for divisiveness. It creates opportunities for, to, for polarization, for, to, for those kind of things to run wild. My, my internal mindset, when, when I'm not choosing to b- imitate Jesus in those moments, if it's left unchecked, guess what happens to me? I start out getting frustrated. Then I get angry. Then I get bitter. And see what happens as those things move along? I want to love people who have that spiritual gift of being fault finders. Why? Because I'm a disciple of Jesus. I want to love the critical relational vampire because it keeps me connected to the vine. How does it keep me connected to the vine? Because I remember, I remember the times. It reminds me how in my life where I felt that I was unlovable, where I felt it and I thought it until I discovered that Jesus loved me. I need to love the critical relational vampire because it anchors me in the truth that everyone is welcome at God's table. If I'm uh, going to love the critical relational vampire, I need to stop trying to do that with, without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. How many times have we tried to love that critical person and we just thought we'd just, you know, put on our big boy, big girl pants and say, this is what I'm supposed to do. And it didn't work. How about you? Do you want to love the critical person in your life like Jesus? Then I want to offer you some possible next steps. Here's the first one. If you... uh, Normally we would invite you to do text in church and if you're a first time person here, but if you'll, uh, if you'll take out your phone and our number is 561-571-8964 and if you'll put in the message portion the word people, uh, you will receive a 28 day uh, reading plan for loving difficult people. Um, it's a Bible reading plan I put together for you and I just encourage you to just put the word People, if you're not ready to do that, you can go to our website at umcpb.org and look under resources, and you'll find, uh, find the link there uh, to do that. But that's the first thing I would encourage you to do. You'll, you know. The second thing is, as I've gone through this message this morning, uh, there may be a name or names that popped in your mind, right? And you may be thinking about that over and over. Uh, I would encourage you to do what I do. Ask Jesus how, what, what do I need to do to be prepared to love the way you love? Uh, number three, I, you know, I, I would encourage you, a plan to, to stay with us throughout the sermon series. Next week, we're going to talk about how to love controlling people. Anybody know any controllers? Yeah. And then the final week, we're going to talk about needy people. You ever been around people who just constantly need, need, need? So we'll, I encourage you just to you know, join us online or, or, or be with us in person. The last thing is that maybe you've heard some things today or as you go through uh, that 28-day reading plan, um, maybe you're like, I, I'd, like to, I'd like a strategic thinking partner. I'd like to sit down and, and talk with somebody about that. Let me encourage you uh, to reach out to the office and schedule a time uh, to sit down and talk with me. Uh, this is big deal stuff. It's hard stuff. But it changes the world if we learn how to love. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you loved us when we are critical, you love us when we're controlling, and you love us when we're needy. But it's not enough for us just to know that you do that for us. 
we also know that you invited us here this morning to hear this message because the people who aren't here matter to you as well. And so, Lord, help us to hear what we heard today, not only for our own sake, but for the sake of others. Help us to take whatever is the the next step that you would have us take, because we really do want to be more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to stand and join our praise team. You know, friends, as uh, we were singing those, those words, it dawned on me, you know one of the biggest critiques people who are not Christians have of Christians is that we have a critical spirit. That we are fault finders. Maybe today is the day that we go and say, oh no, no, we are, we are story people. 
we want to hear your story. We're empathy people. We're people of love and compassion and generosity. But the only way we can do that is if we go as people who know that we are loved. If we go as people who know that we are beloved sons and daughters of God. If we go as people knowing that no matter where we are, no matter what situation we face in life, God is and God always will be with us. Amen? Amen. Let's join.